Carnegie Mellon University's advanced database systems course is filmed in front of a live studio audience. Let's get started. All right, so today we're going to talk about um, vectorized query execution. Again, this has been the thing we've been leading up to the entire semester. Like this, you know, we've been saying this is the this is one of the ways that like a modern OLAP system is going to get good query performance. We'll see why and why why and why it doesn't always do this. So last class we talked about uh, how to take a query plan, divide it up into pipelines, and run them in parallel. Uh, and so this is a notion of this this method of doing is called task parallelization. So how to take a a, a, a query plan, break it up into tasks, and run those in parallel. We have said, haven't said how to schedule them and where to schedule them. That'll be in, uh, in next week. Um, but at a high level, we understand we could run things in parallel. We need to coalesce things with, with exchange operators. And then we also discussed how we, the Navy system would actually would evaluate any kind of expressions in a where clause or a, uh, or a join clause. And we saw this as being a we sort of preview to query compilation stuff that we'll talk about on um, or just-in-time compilation or code generation stuff we'll talk about on, on Wednesday this week. Um, and then we also took, introduced the idea of query adaptivity. We didn't, we're not going to push on this too much just yet, but it's the idea that the optimizer spits out a query plan, and then at runtime, while the data system is executing that query, it can decide whether that query plan was a good idea or not, and can make some changes either to uh, change the ordering that, that, it, that it checks predicates, uh, how, what code path it would use to do certain things, but then we'll see later in the semester how to do bigger things like change the actual query plan on the fly while we're running. Okay. So today's task or today's class is going to be about uh, vectorization. And the idea here is that we want to take the scalar algorithms that we discussed in the introduction class, um, where we're going to operate on a single tuple at a time, um, and in some cases even a single operand at a time, and we're going to convert them into a vectorized form and rely on uh, a, a SIMD instructions that the CPU can provide for us to be able to run our uh, run multiple operations within or uh, within an operator or expression, whatever we're trying to do, at the same time. And so this is the main notion is data parallelization that we're going to have multiple you know computations occurring at the same time for multiple pieces of data, and, and then SIMD is going to be the way that uh, we're going to achieve this. So why does this matter? Well, again, the same way that scaling out across multiple, multiple threads, processes, or, or, or nodes, it's going to give us additional you know, improvement in performance because we're not being restricted to what a single thread on a single core can do. In some cases, we can get even bigger speed up because of SIMD, because that also can run parallel across multiple cores. And then the, uh, the speed up we'll get will be multiplicative. Right? So every core, we can run, have a data parallel algorithm and across all those cores, again, they're all running at the same time. So let's say that I'm on a machine that has 32 cores, assuming I can scale out perfectly linearly, then I can, and I can divide my task up into 32 dis discrete, discrete tasks. Right? So that's a 32x speed up. And then if I can have a uh, portion of that computation, ignoring how we get tuples in and out for now, that can run on using SIMD, and it can do process four tuples at a time, so then it's 32x times 4x. So in, in theory, for this scenario here, we could get up to 128x improvement in, in performance. And that's just on, on a single node. And that's pretty significant, right? Anything that's, that's you know, at least an order of magnitude is, is a huge win. Two orders of magnitude is, would be unheard of. Now, we're never going to come close to this. Because as, as I was saying, there's a bunch of stuff we have to do to get things in and out of the registers, in and out between operators, copying things from disks, sending things over the, over the network. Like this, we're never even going to come close. Uh, and in some best case scenario, when we look at some vectorized algorithms, we might get 1.4x speed up if we're lucky. All right? All right, but that doesn't mean we, should, we shouldn't be doing this. All right, so we covered this, uh, I think, early in the semester. We did, I did a quick preview of what SIMD actually is. So I don't want to spend too much time in it. Again, the idea goes back to this, this, or this, this notion of this classification of what these instructions are actually going to be, goes back to the 1960s. Uh, there was this thing called Flynn's taxonomy where he described you know, what SISD instructions are, SIMD, and I think MIMD as, as well. And I think at the time they were all theoretical, like you, know, you could have these things in the 60s, but obviously now in the 2020s, you know, these things have been around for, for quite a while. Um, so we can, you know, we can exploit them and use them inside of our database systems. So SIMD is going to be a class of CPU instructions that can allow 
again, a processor to do multiple, uh, to do the same operation on multiple pieces of data at the same time. And the way this is going to work is that we're going to rely on these special SIMD registers as a way to get things into these instructions and out of these instructions. And the overall goal as we go through is that we want to keep things out in the SIMD registers for as long as possible, do as much processing as we can. Uh, and in the paper you guys read, talked about because AVX 512, we can achieve this now uh, better than we used to. So you want to keep things out in the SIMD registers as long as possible and only bring it out to the, to back to the CPU cache or memory uh, when we're done with uh, whatever it is we're going to do. So we're going to focus most of this lecture on AVX 512, uh, but this is showing here that there's every other ISA has their own variants of them. Uh, and the case of, of Intel, it uh, goes back to the 1990s when they first put out these MMX stuff. Yes? I've heard of ARM at risk. Was PowerPC that really still a thing? The question is, is PowerPC still a thing? Uh, I mean, what do you mean still a thing? Like, does it exist? Yes. Are people paying a lot of money? What's the market share? Like, what's the target? Oh, what's the market share of PowerPC for databases? I mean, pretty small. But there's enough, uh, there's enough legacy software that's running on some really old you know, systems running, that need to run on PowerPC, right? I mean, IMS is still like the number one. I think, I think I'm, I don't know if this is still true. I saw some reports saying I, IBM makes most of its money on, from IMS more than any other piece of software. And they invented that for the Apollo moon mission in the 60s, right? Because there's all these banks that are still running on this stuff, right? Again, if it's mission critical, you don't want to mess around like, yeah, let me just, like, you know, let me just switch to something else because it'd be you know, a major engineering effort. And if it fails, then your business is screwed, right? PowerPC has some other advantages over, uh, over x86 for a variety of things. But I mean, yeah, if you were like a brand new startup today, would you use PowerPC? No, right? I, I, I mean, I, you can't get it from, from any of the cloud vendors, right? So, OK. Um, Right, yes, I mean, so again, this is just saying that th these, there's other, uh, there's other sort of categories, and not, not really categories, or releases of SIMD instructions for, for different platforms, ISAs, not just the AVX stuff. Um, but again, we're going to focus on this because this is, when, they read, when Intel put this out, it, they added some, some additional things that make it better for database systems in a way that we didn't have before, where we had to sort of emulate stuff ourselves. All right, so this is the example that I, that I showed before. We, we just want to do a simple operation, uh, take uh, two matrices, X plus Y, add them together, produce a new matrix, uh, Z. So again, if you're going to write this in sc with scalar code or using SysD instructions, you just have a for loop that iterates over every element of, of X and I, and then write out the Z. So you're literally just scaling or going through the, each element of the two arrays one by one, running one instruction to add them together, and then one store instruction to put it out into the output buffer to Z, right? And you know, the, the compiler can be smart about this. It can unroll it, right, to, to, to speed things up. But for now, at, at the end of the day, it's still going to have to execute a single instruction to, to add two numbers together and to write it out to another register or another, uh, write it out to memory. So with SIMD, what we can do is we can take a, a vector of, of, of values. And assuming here we're doing 32-bit numbers, four elements, so it's a 120-bit bit register. Again, AVX 512 is going to be 512 bit registers, so we can put more things in there. So now it's going to be one SIMD instruction to add up the, the offsets, the, the matching offsets across the two registers and produce a single output. And then do the same thing for the other one, add it together and produce the output. So what took before eight instructions to do eight addition instructions, now we can do it down to two. Right? So this is why this, this is going to be important, obviously, for databases where if, if we're trying to rip through you know, columns and columns and billions of tuples. We want to be able to, to uh, take advantage of this. So there's two type of uh, vectorization we can have uh, in our system, in our data system. The first is what I just showed. Uh, or the, the first would be what is called horizontal vectorization, where the idea is that you want to have some instruction that's going to take all the elements within a SIMD register and then produce a single scalar output. Like if I want to get this, the summation of all the elements within this the four, you know, four lane register here, Right? There's some instruction that can do that and that produces some scalar output there. Uh, early CPUs don't support this. Uh, it's, it's mostly found in the newer CPUs that, that can do, or at least on x86, like, uh, that can do AVX2, which is the precursor to AVX512. Um, but this is, this is not going to be that entirely useful for the stuff we want to do in databases. The one we care about is vertical vectorization, where the idea, again, is that we have 
two registers, and they're lined up across lanes. So assuming the values are all fixed length of the same size, and we just next to one instruction to do some operation on the combination of the two, and then produce it, produce a new, uh, produce a new applet. So this is way more common. This is this is this is the technique we're mostly going to be using in in our database uh, going forward. But again, you could do this as well. Actually, yeah, so I think this top one here, I think this shows, like, think of like a summation. If I want to add up all the, sum all the values in a column, right? You, you could use horizontal uh, vectorization for that. So this is just a table just showing that, yes? Is it our horizontal, is horizontal vectorization, I know vertical vectorization is used in practice, but a horizontal vector, is it, is it like used in any field system? Like, like I, his question, is it used in real systems? I think so, yes. Okay. Yeah. I think, I think we have an example of ClickHouse. I think ClickHouse is doing this for summation. Okay. Yeah. Uh, all right, so this is just a table showing you the history of, of the different SIMD extensions that Intel has put out over the years. And again, the one we care about here is the bottom that came out in 2017, AVX 512. So the register is going to be 512 bits. It's going to support integers, uh, single precision, and double precision floating numbers. Um, right, th this, and then the big one is going to be that you read in the paper is that they're going to, they're going to support these permutations or predicate masks that allow us to keep track of or, or specify which lane uh, should an operation actually apply on. And prior to that, this coming out in AVX 512, this is something that the database system would have to do themselves by basically using a separate register to store like a bit mask like that. Whereas now, in the case of, of AVX 512, there's explicit registers to, to do those things. So this link here will take you to a great presentation by James Van Dieris. He was a, I think an Intel fellow. It's from, I think, 2017 or so. But he gives a good history of all these things and why this matters and, and what the, some of the cool things in AVX 512. So if you're interested in this kind of stuff, uh, you can go check it out. All right, so as I said, AVX 512 is the one that we care about, right? Uh, it's not to say that people weren't doing vectorization in databases before this. Uh, it just makes everything a, a lot easier. Um, and so the, in addition to having the, the new, 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 new instructions to do data conversions and, and scatter operations, which is, we'll cover in a second, that permutations is, is the big one, right? To be able to say, here's some bit mask that says, I want certain operations to only, the operation I'm going to apply to only occur at, at these different lanes, right? And so the, uh, but the, the downside, though, is that unlike in the AVX2 and SS, SSE you know, 2, 3, and 4, like in these earlier extensions to x86 or SIMD, they were all all or nothing. Meaning, like, if I said my CPU supported AVX2, I got all the, the capabilities and instructions that I would expect to have in AVX2. For whatever reason, it's an Intel thing, that when AVX512 came out, they broke it up into groups. So now, when you buy a processor, you have to go check, like, the, the, the CPU flags to see what instructions you actually support. Um, and we'll see an example, again, from ClickHouse. Well, they'll have, you know, if blocks in their code that says, am, am I compiling to AVX512 with this group or that group versus that group? because right, they're going to have different structures and different capabilities. So to give you an idea of sort of how confusing it is, like this is from Wikipedia. This is showing the, all the different groups you could have for AVX 512, and then which, which iterations of the ISA, going back to the Xeon Phi, um, actually supports these. And so you can see, not everyone has, has everything. Right? There's another chart here from, I think, one of the papers. So again, they're showing you how these things have been sort of added over time, but then now within... Uh, Here's a little stuff in the AVX 512, but like, there's newer versions that don't have things of the early versions. So even though you say you support AVX 512, you, you, the system has to go check what actually it has. Um, again, we'll look at a ClickHouse as an example in a second. They have if clauses in, when, in, in their source code that figures out what CPU capabilities are, are available. So again, there'll be other, some issue, other issues with AVX 512 in a second, where, uh, but I, I, I don't want to spoil it just yet. So even though I'm going to spend most of the time and say, hey, great, you can do this, AVX 512, in the back of your mind, realize, like, you may not always be able to do this. In some cases, you actually may run slower if you, if you use AVX 512. Well, I'll, I'll explain why in a second. All right, so how do we actually want to get, how do we want to actually use this, right? Um, and there's basic three approaches. Do I want the compiler to figure out what, what it can vectorize? Do I want to give hints to the compiler to say how to vectorize things? Or do I want to do the vectorization myself? And so the way to think about these, these, these three approaches is that the, the top one is be the easiest to use because you don't really have to think about it in some ways. Sometimes you do, sometimes you don't, right? And you just hope the compiler can, can figure out how to compile things and vectorize your, your, your algorithm. 
Um, and if you design your, your database system in such a way that you break things up into small enough chunks that are just, again, looping over, over arrays, then the compiler could potentially be able to figure it out, but not always. Compiler hints is it's giving a little nudge to the compiler to say, hey, look, you really can vectorize this. I think you should, and hope it tries to figure it out. And then the last one is like you write the actual instructions in, the, in, in, your, in, your, in your code to actually invoke the exact SIMD, oper SIMD instructions you want. So let's go through these one by one. So they said automatic vectorization, the idea is that the compiler can potentially identify when certain instructions inside of a tight loop could be rewritten as vectorized instructions. Right? And so my example that I showed in the very beginning, that iterating over uh, you know, an array, two arrays, and adding them together, that's something obviously uh, that the, the compiler should be able to figure out. So this is only going to work for uh, simple loops. Um, and in some cases, in database systems, it doesn't always pan out. This has gotten better than the GCC and Clang. And certainly ICC have gotten a lot better, where it can start figuring these things out without hints. Um, but maybe five years ago, this, this was an issue. And obviously, if you don't have SIMD instructions on your CPU that you're, you're compiling on, the compiler is not going to try to use it. So if you, you say you compile on your laptop that doesn't have AVX 512, you take that binary, pull it up, plop it up on your you know, enterprise-grade Xeon server, even though the Xeon server is going to have 512, it was compiled without it at the time because it compiled on your laptop. So you've got to be mindful of like, where you're actually compiling and running things. So this is our example that we had before, uh, where we now we're now going to pass in pointers to uh, arrays x, y, and z, and we're going to loop over them by some, some max value and add them together. Right? Can we auto-vectorize this? She's shaking her head yes. Raise your hand if you think yes. Raise your hand if you say no. Why no? Need restrict. Well, he says need to restrict, but what does that mean? Uh, but, but, but why? Why? Because if the pointers overlap, then there's dependency. Yes, so he says if the pointers overlap, then, then there's dependency. So again, think of compile time. Do I know what, what the pointers of X, Y, and Z are pointing to? No. Right? That's a runtime thing. So in this case here, the, the compiler is going to say, hey, X, Y, and Z could actually be pointing to the same thing. So I can't vectorize this because let's say that uh, Z is just you know, one byte more than, than the memory address of X. So now if I'm ripping through my, uh, my, my code or at, at runtime, in the scalar version for one iteration of X, or one iteration of the loop, I'll overwrite what the next value should, actually, should be, right? And so now in the next iteration, I'll get, I'll get a different co computation. But if I vectorize that with SIMD, then the, when I do the computation of the second iteration, it won't see the effects of the first iteration, so it actually produce a different result. So the compilers be very, very careful to make sure that if it vectorizes your code, it doesn't produce something that, 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 that generates a different value or different computation than, than it would have if it was scalar code. Yes. So can compilers do like uh, loop unrolling, like, and then automatically? Like, like. Here's can't, can't the compiler do loop unrolling and then auto vectorize that? But again, you don't know what Z is actually pointing to potentially, right? So it's going to be very conservative. It's gonna, like it doesn't want to avoid, it wants to avoid any kind of problems. So in this case here, it's going to say, I, I, I don't know what X, Y, and Z are actually pointing to, so I can't vectorize this. So his, sorry, question. Uh, for us, we actually can't say that. Well, well he said, the statement is, for us, you can't do that. Yes. Yeah. We'll get that in a second. OK. <laughs> All right, we're, we're in C++ C land, OK? All right, so, uh, all right, so, so the, 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 he said, Patrick said, oh, you could use the restrict keyword. And that's an example of a compiler hint. So that's, it's we as the programmer can tell the compiler something about our code to make it more likely to try to auto-vectorize something. And so the, the restrict keyword to see in a second, that's an example of giving explicit information about memory locations to say, these things can't overlap. They're not going to change uh, while, while this loop is running. Therefore, you can auto-vectorize it. The more, a more uh, brute force approach, you just tell the compiler, hey, turn off any checks for dependencies or aliasing here. Right? And just vectorize it, trust me. Like, you know, driving without the seatbelt. Right? So going back to our uh, function before, as he said, if you add the restrict keyword, which is in C99, but it's not in the C++ standard, but pretty much every C++ uh, compiler supports it, um, 
right? You add the district keyword, and that's telling you that these arrays are going to be distinct locations uh, that were the, the, the it's, it's, for the lifetime of the pointer, they're not going to change, at least within this function. So therefore, it's, it knows that it's safe to actually vectorize this. So this approach is, is, is widely used. Uh, like, so if you go look at like in DuckDB, you just search for restrict, and then in C++, the, it's underscore, underscore restrict. And so you see all these functions are, are set up to do this kind of stuff, right? Um, and the goal here is that the, you know, DuckDB wants the compiler to figure out how to auto-vectorize this. So it's passing that hint to, hint to it. A point also too here, you can see sort of two versions of, the, of, of doing this check here, right? There's the, is, is all the, is, the bit mask I'm getting, is everything, is that, if everything's not valid, then I have to check my bit mask to see whether it's valid. If I know everything is valid, then I can skip that extra check, right? So that's, we saw that sort of technique with um, we're checking for nulls with, uh, with Velox, right? So even though there's a conditional here, uh, you know, it, it's, it's worth it not to do that additional check on, on rows. This is a ClickHouse. ClickHouse does the same thing up above. Uh, so this is to do a, uh, an aggregate sum computation, uh, which I think would be horizontal uh, vectorization. But again, you see this under, underscore, underscore restrict on the pointer. But then they had this other beast in here, which is uh, they're actually checking again what AVX 512 group the CPU actually has, then has different implementations to, to do that computation. Yes? You should be able to if def that, right? The question is you should be able to if def this. These are all like macros too. Yeah. Oh, they're all macros? Yeah, when look, these are all like crazy macros that get uh, auto generate the code. I don't, I don't know about, yeah, I think that's probably, that's probably also pound def. As well, if def. I'd be concerned if his arch supported with that. It's it, and it's probably it's. I think it's an if def. I mean, anything up above, you have like uh, you know, use multi-target CPU code. No, 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 it can still be if. It'll just the compiler will get rid of it if it's not right because all of those yeah. are going to yeah, be it would be dead code. Yes. Yeah. Be but anyway, the point is, this is a good example of like, hey, here's the, you know. There's two versions of AVX 512, there's AVX 2, there's SSC 4, which is the precursor to AVX 2, right? So the main thing I care about is here, like, it's AVX 512. Oh, no, no, not really. You have to, you have to check what group you actually have, All right? All right, so restrict is probably the most common one. An alternative is use these pragmas, uh, IV dep, uh, which is basically ignore uh, vector dependencies or vectorization dependencies. OpenMP, the big parallelization framework library, they have, like, uh, Pragma SIMD, like, there's different versions of this. And this basically says ignore any of your aliasing checks when you do and auto vectorize this, right? And you would end up with the same thing. And again, this is up to the data programmer to make sure that this is done correctly because the compiler will do whatever you will likely do whatever you want it to do. All right, the last alternative is do explicit vectorization. And for this one, we're, we're going to have to rely on what are called intrinsics or CPU intrinsics. And you think of an intrinsic as like a, uh, like a, I don't say virtual function, but it's like a fake function in, the, in your C++ code. It looks like a function, but it has an underscore or a double underscore in front of it. And it really is translating into the exact SIMD instruction that you want the compiler to, to omit for that, that line of code, right? And that's how you call, call explicitly the, the SIMD operation that you, that you want or you know, put things into registers and what registers you want to touch and so forth. Um, now, the problem with this is that you know, if you want exact control of your database system, this is what you, know, you need to use this. And uh, talking to friends in industry, this is what BigQuery does. This is what, uh, this is what Redshift does and some other systems. And in that environment, because they're hosted database systems, they control the hardware. They know what VMs they're running on in, in the cloud. So they can, they can make that choice. They're not, you know, they're not trying to run a PowerPC, for example. But obviously, if you use like an x86 intrinsic, you can't run on ARM or some other, some other CPU. Now, there are some libraries that can hide some of these SIMD intrinsics and have ways to step down to, uh, to uh, you know, the smaller register size as needed or based on what grouping or extensions you support. Google Highway is probably the most common one. I don't know of any data system that actually uses this. I guess we, we could just you know, grab the source code, open source ones to figure it out. Um, LibSIMD is another one that's, com that, that's why these, again, I'm not sure outside databases. Rust has its own uh, SIMD uh, library, but it's, I think it's only turned on for experimental nightly. Um, I've never used it. Uh, the, the one student that was here before, Chi, he says you just use this, you, you just let's auto vectorization handle everything. And as you said, 
because the compiler is in better shape to understand whether things will collide because there's more explicit control over uh, memory locations. All right, so if you were going to use intrinsics without one of these libraries, it would essentially look like this, right? You have these underscore, underscore, and then the, the, some, some prefix of what sort of group of SIMD extensions you're using. Then you say what size the register you want. What, you know, an I means you're storing integer. So all we're doing here is casting the, the integer vectors we, we were given, putting them into the SIMD registers, and then now we can do our, our, do our loop and do SIMD addition and then store it in the, uh, in the output vector we want. And now you can see here our loop, we're, going, we're, we're doing four additions at the same time. So we, don't, we need you know divide the number of iterations we would have divided by four. Right? So this is roughly what, what it looks like. All right, so which one do you think is the best? Explicit. Explicit. Most control. Like this. Most control. For this specific example? Well, I can maybe that. What is the best for, for performance? Explicit. What's the easiest to write? Yes, as I said before. So let's see. Uh, let's see how. What, so let's see what the performance difference you get from like explicitly writing uh, vectorized code. So this is the paper we did with the Germans a few years ago, um, where we compared against uh, the vectorized the vectorized approach for for doing query processing, and then the the hyper approach, which we'll cover next class. Um, and the, the student in Germany wrote sort of one system that supported both, both of these techniques, and we, we did a bake-off between the two of them. And the idea is to strip out all the extra stuff that, that, that differentiates between you know, vector-wise or hyper or other systems, get it down to a, a common substrate to the extent that you can um, for these two approaches. And then that way you have a pure you know, apples-to-apples -apples comparison between the different approaches. right? Because there's, there's other things that would come up, like the way hyper does numerics would be different than vector-wise, and for some queries in TPCH, you know, that, that would make actually a big difference. So it was a single test bed system that did both vector-wise and, and hyper, which we'll cover next class. And we just wanted to measure how well a compiler can, uh, can auto-vectorize a bunch of the vector-wise primitives. Um, so again, think of like a primitive being a single function that takes an array or a vector of, of tuples of a certain type and runs like, you know, is something less than something, is something greater than something? Like how well could it vectorize those sort of small loops of code, similar to what I showed before? And so we compared against, we used Clang, GCC, and ICC, which is Intel's compiler. We, and ICC, it's not free, it's not open source, but this is obviously way better at auto vectorizing, at least a few years ago, than, than GCC and Clang was. Again, GCC and Clang have gotten better, but at the time, ICC was, was much, much, much better. And again, you, you pay for that because Intel you know, Intel controls the hardware, they obviously can write really good compilers for it to it as well. So we're going to basically do a comparison between hashing, a selection, and, and a projection. And there's some other operations we, that you have to run for the full query we didn't, we didn't vectorize, because you can't. All right, so this is running across uh, some, some select number of queries of TPCH. Um, and the first bar here is complete auto vectorization. Let the compiler do everything. The, the black bar would be just if you, if you do it by hand. And then the, the red bar would be the combination of let the, let the compiler auto-vectorize everything. Then we would go check and see whether which functions didn't get auto-vectorized. And we go back and, and do that and manually here. And what we're measuring here is the uh, reduction of the, of the number of instructions versus like uh, a, a, a scalar approach when you don't do any vectorization. You don't, you don't let the compiler do any vectorization, right? So you know, the main takeaway here is that the I mean, higher, in this case, higher is better, uh, but there are some cases where the the you know the the manual one, for whatever reason, like because it was just it was so complicated to actually write, we always didn't get a huge improvement uh, in the reduction of number of instructions. But the combination of letting what the compiler does and then going back as a human and cleaning things up, uh, you know, was, was actually the best approach for all of these, right? Uh, so, so the statement is, uh, the statement is like, can you, would this not work in a real system because you don't know the queries ahead of time? Again, we're, 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 we're trying to vectorize the primitives, right? And they're not specific to any one query. Like, take a column of the integers, check to see whether the, the number is less than, than a, a single value. That's what we were auto-vectorizing. It wasn't hard-coded exactly for, you know, Q1, Q6, and so forth, right? So technically, it was still a general purpose system. We're just trying to auto-vectorize, like, the actual low-level operations or primitives within them. Yes? Q6 was worse? 
Yeah, I forget what I, I forget why that was the case. Uh, again, it, it's the. Yeah, I, I I have to go read the paper. I, I forget why that was the case. Yes. Why is what? Why, why is Q6? Uh, why is Q6 before Q3? I, I, I have to go look at I, I, this. We read the paper a while ago. I have to go check. Um, it doesn't matter. Yeah. It might be a typo. Maybe, maybe this is really Q3 and this is Q6, but it doesn't matter. So the key takeaway is that you should do automatic and manual? Yeah, the main, ta main takeaway of this is that you should do both. Yes. His question is, what is auto plus manual? So you, you auto vectorize everything. Then you actually look at what, what was actually generated in the assembly, figure out wh what functions or primitives were not auto generated, auto vectorized. Then you go back and rewrite them, the actual C++ code, to put in, put in the intrinsics. Are you saying manual was not done right? Uh, I mean, they're German, so like I, I'm assuming it's done right. Um, and maybe, again, I have to go look at what exactly this query was. I think the idea was that the... Yeah, of course, like, in theory, you could have also looked to see what this thing vectorized to, right, and then write the equivalent intrinsics for that. But I don't think he did that. I think the idea was like, okay, if, 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 if you bring in a German who, has, like, who knows what they're doing, uh, how well can they do implementing it themselves? Um, I, I, again, I don't want to, we, we can go look up the results again. I, I, we, can, we can go into more detail in the next class. Uh, the reason why I didn't have you guys read this paper is because it's, it's compilation plus vectorization at the same time in one, one single evaluation. So I, I cherry picked this result out just because there's focus on vectorization. So I wanted to cover compilation first, and then we can talk a little bit this, uh, as well. So I can follow up and figure out what's actually going on here. Everything's open source online as well, so we, we could check it out, what happened. All right, so but now we can check to see what the, what the performance difference actually is. And so in this case here, we're measuring in what's the reduction of time of, 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 the, of, the, of the system running these queries between the different implementations. So it's all relative to, again, the scalar function, scalar implementation. So if you're above zero, it's faster. If you're below zero, it's worse. And so you can see in some cases here, especially for uh, Q6, even though that one code he wrote by hand had more instructions, it was actually faster than the one that, that was the combination of, of auto vectorization and, and manual. Or in the case of here, in case of Q3 going back, right, they reduced the number of instructions, but it was done in such a way that it was actually slower. Manual's the best, though? Manual's always the best, yes. But the point I'm trying to make is it, to write that is hard. So, the, so the, if, you have, if you have the capability to do it, like if you have a German in-house or you can just spend the time doing it, the red one's probably what you want. I forget what percentage of he actually had to go touch up, right? But if you spend the time and effort, you can get, because it's, it's almost equivalent to writing assembly. And you, you'll, you, you know, that'll be any compiler. Manual is literally, it's, 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 uh, manual is the last one, explicit vectorization calling intrinsics. This is compiler hints, and this is compiler hints, and then what doesn't get vectorized, you go and put intrinsics. Yes? I'm a little baffled about Q9 and Q18. You're telling me the, you, the compiler tried to vectorize it and still somehow performed worse? Yes. We'll cover this in a second, yes. It, it, I guess a hint, anybody even know why? No. All right, we'll, we'll get to the end. There's a footnote in the paper you guys read that explains it. We'll get to it at the end. Let me just make sure I didn't miss anything on this. Is it the same reason why most optimizers do like dash 02 instead of dash 03? Uh, same thing is, is it the same reason why most compilers do dash 03 instead of 02? No, the 02 is the 03. Is it do 02 instead of No. Bingo, that's it. So he said it's because the new versions downclock or downcycle the CPU. 
So when you call AVX512, they turn down the clock speed. Right? And some compilers uh, will actually not auto-vectorize AVX512, they always choose AVX2 because of this exact reason. Because of heating issues. Yes. It's heating, it's heating issues, my understanding, yes. You know, in the early versions of SIMD, like in the 90s, the MMX stuff, there was literally like, uh, like you would call scale instructions, but when you called SIMD instructions, it would stop all the SIMD instructions, switch over to SIMD mode, run that, then switch back. Now with superscalar architecture, we can run these things in parallel, but as I said, like for, I, I, I don't know whether it's all, the, all AVX 512 instructions, but at least enough of them, like it'll get down clocked. I don't know whether these are, uh, I think all, I think x86 is, or, you know, the, the current crop is Intel CPUs all have this issue. And so Intel, we'll, we'll cover this in, at the end, Intel actually turns off AVX fail. They fuse it off on consumer grade CPUs because they don't want people to get down cycle and think that, you know, the, the CPU is running slower than it should. Yes? Do other CPU vendors, does the one other CPU vendor for x86 that would be relevant in this case also down clock? This question is, does AMD also do this? <laughs> uh, I don't think AMD, AMD has AVX 512. Wait, oh, they don't? They, they do? The new ones do, yeah. The new ones? Okay. I, I don't know what they, they down clock. Do you know, like, the reason behind the down clock? Heat. He says, uh, he uses the scientific term, is it because they're doing a lot of stuff? <laughs> yes, yes, a, yes. I, again, this, is, this is not a class about like Intel's design decisions, like I don't, because I don't know the answer. I'm only telling you what you can read. Sorry, yes. I had to double check, they might be using AVX2. I don't, I don't know, I, 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 we, we can cover this next class. Okay, again, this is not like let's bash on Intel. Um, but again, this is just what I said in the beginning. Just because it's there doesn't mean it's always going to work. And in some cases, AVX2 is going to be better because they won't have that, that down clocking, down cycle issue. All right, so now let's go through the primitives that we're going to use as building blocks that allow us to do, that we can, you can construct and put together so they're doing more complex functionality to actually start running, running, running queries. Um, and this would be a combination of what was in the paper you guys read and then some earlier paper that I'll, I'll cover a little bit as well of like, and these are the basic primitives that SIMDs can provide for us that we can then put together to start doing the larger you know, database uh, operations or algorithms that we need. So the big one I said is that AVX 512 added, can, ignoring the, the, the down clocking issue, is that they have now, uh, op all the instructions have these predication variants where you can pass in a, a bit mask that says which lanes you want to be applied, you want the operation to be applied at, right? Again, prior to AVX 512, you could do this, but you would have to, you would have to use a separate, you know, use one of the SIMD registers that are available to you to actually then apply it. So now there's specialized ones that are just for, for the bit masks. The number of registers, I think, in the latest version is like 32, right? So we're not talking thousands and thousands of registers. Uh, AVX 512 going to 32 is a lot. I think it used to be low 20s, right? So there's more available to us, but it's still, still not infinite. So the idea is that, say I have uh, two vectors here I want to I do some operation on. And you think of these, again, the, the, the offsets have sort of line up uh, across the, the, the lanes. And so say in the, I have this bit mask here set to 1, so that's going to say whatever I want, want my output to be, uh, for whatever my, my instructions going to be, only apply it for the lanes where this thing is actually set to 1. Right? So say I'm just doing addition, then the output would just be you know, 3 plus 2 and 3 plus 2 to produce the output 5 here. And then for the, the ones where it's 0, you pass, this, you pass in this merge source register, and then that just is being used to fill in uh, where the zeros are to put in a value there, right? So you can put any value in. There's also the variant of zero masking, uh, or, where it just, you don't have to pass this explicit register. It, it just puts zeros where, where everything is, right? So that's the basic idea. So with this bit mask, which again, we say we can generate because in some cases in our, in our algorithms, when we apply filters, like the, the ones and zeros corresponding what, to what tuples or what offset actually satisfy the predicate. So that's, the, that's sort of the basic construct we can carry along in our, in our operations to, to determine whether a tuple is even valid or not. All right, so the first thing we're going to do is permute. 
And the idea here is that we want to copy values from an input vector uh, specified at some offset to, to some other destination vector. Right? And again, in the prior to AVX512, the way you had to do this is, is take things out of the vectors, put it into memory, do, and then put it back in the vectors into to the right order. But now, again, with AVX512, we can do all of this within register directly into register, and that's way faster, and we don't pollute the CPU caches or slow things down. Right? So the idea here is that here's our input vector, uh, here's the index vector that's going to correspond to where we're going to write things to. So in this case here, for this first value, sorry, first index value, if we're going to this position here, we want the, the, the value within the input vector at offset 3, which is D, so that gets written here. And so it's done this all down the line. I don't know why the, the errors didn't line up. Uh, but it does this all down the line and then it, it, it populates that. And that's, again, that's all done in, as a single instruction, uh, even though I'm showing it in different, uh, is, you know, different steps on PowerPoint. All right, the next one we have is a selective load. And the idea here is we want to take some contents that we have in memory and we want to be able to write them out to, to, our, to some input vector. Right? Yeah, wow, I don't know why these, these aren't lining up. That's weird. Whatever. All right, so, uh, all right, so again, we have our mask. And so what's going to happen is in this first position here, it's just going to skip. So it doesn't overwrite whatever's in the vector right now. So then it's all where the ones are, and it's going to grab whatever the first location that it has, because you give it this offset, the starting location of the, of the, of the input, memory vector, or input memory buffer or address. And so every time it sees it one, it's going to increment over by one and then write that value up. So in this case here, we're going to write u to the second slot. We're going to skip, skip this one here, leave that alone, and then go to the next one. We'll write v to that slot. Right? Again, all happens within a single instruction. Select the store is going the other opposite direction in reverse. The, the top is our target, so we want to write out into memory. So the same thing, going across, we skip the zero, the one gets written to the first position, and then the skip that zero, and that one's written to the second position. And then we're done. So this is how we're going to get things in the registers and then out of the registers. But again, more than just like blind copies, we can be clever about how, how we write things. So then we can use compress to, uh, to move things across the different vectors in different ways. Um, so in this case here, we have our target vector is the value vector at the top, and we have input vector, and then this index vector. So the idea here is that for the, uh, the first, if ever there's a 1, we're going to write out something up there. right? So same thing here. We write the D up to that first position, and then everything else is just left as zeros. Right? So, we're, so we're basically compressing down whatever was in our input vector to fill in the uh, you know, things in, in sort of the beginning to the end until we, until we run out of space or we have no more items to put into it. Expand is the reverse, right? So we have the one here. So the, the first one will get, sorry, the first value within our input vector will get written to that position. Same thing with the, the next one over there. And then the rest of it all just zeros. So that's taking what was compressed uh, on, on this side, potentially by, by this operation, and then expanding it out back to, what, to its original form. So again, they're just reverses of each other. All right, so then we can do a selective a scatter and gather. And the idea here is like, how do we actually get things we, specific things we want out of, the, uh, out of our, our memory into the registers or registers back into memory? So in this case here, I want to take the, whatever's in the, at this offset specified by the index vector, jump to my offset in memory, and then write that out to the first position. Right, so two would be this position here, and that's written to the first position and then so forth for all the other ones there. All right? So now we can basically, you're, you're, you're changing the order of how things are written out to memory, and, but lining them up the way you want them inside the, the vector. Again, the selective gather is the reverse. Again, we're taking a, a value vector and then specifying what memory location we want to write things into. So again, so in this case here, the index vector wants to write to 2. We take the first position at this lane as A, and it writes to memory position 2. All right? So I, I don't know whether they uh, I don't know whether they they require the 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 memory location you're writing to 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 fit within a single cache line. There's alignment issues. I think the hardware takes care of all that all that for you, right? Because this index vector this can't be you know a million elements. So you're not going to be writing out to all different locations of memory. But this thing roughly has to fit into a, a you know single cache line. Because L1 you can do I think one or two loads and stores uh, per cycle. Right, so you obviously don't want to spend a lot of cycles just filling out, taking things out of the vector and putting, putting it in. All right, so again, these are the basic constructs. I'm going through them quickly just to say, like, OK, there's ways to pass in these bitmaps or these index vectors to specify where you want things to go to and where you want things to come from. 
when you move things in and out of the vectors and in, in, into memory. So let's talk about how we actually want to put this in the side of a data system. So I'm going to go through some some basic operations that we, we, we can use, we can build using uh, SIMD and vectorization. And in most cases, we're almost always going to want to favor vertical uh, vectorization. We're going to have different tuples within the different lanes of, our, of our, our SIMD register so that we can process them in parallel. So again, horizontal vectorization would be either like I'm trying to sum up all the values within a vector, or say I'm trying to do a string comparison over a long, long string, and that's breaking up into uh, across different lanes. We're, we're going to ignore all of that. And our goal here is that we want to maximize lane utilization, meaning we don't want to have our computations that we're doing you know, in our SIMD, SIMD instructions to operate on things we know have been evicted or know have, have been removed before. Like if something does not evaluate to true, uh, you know, it doesn't make sense to do a bunch of more expensive computations for it. We want to ideally be able to you know, fill it in with something else that's useful. And the paper you read talked about that, and we'll, we'll see some other ways to do it as well. All right, so we'll first talk about the basic selection scan, then we'll talk about how to do vector refill, and then I'll talk about two variants of doing uh, hash tables for joins. And then this is not the paper you guys read, but for partition histograms, this one is like a really simple idea that I think is pretty clever. Um, and again, it comes from this paper in Columbia. So this paper here, this is the, the, from 2015. This is from some researchers at Columbia. I, I used to have the students, you guys read this, uh, but I don't have it, read it. You, don't, you don't read it anymore. I read the German one because in this one, they make a bunch of assumptions that aren't real because um, it was 2015. It was for AVX512. So they assumed all your values were 32 bits and that your pointers were always 32 bits. Um, but obviously, in, in the real, real workloads, the real, real databases, that's not always true. Um, and then they also assume that everything's going to fit in L3 cache, which obviously does not always, always pan out to be true. All right. All right, so let's go back to how to do a basic uh, scan operation. So this is the code that I showed before, how to do a branchless scan, where we're always going to copy our output into uh, any tuple that we're given to the output buffer. But then we run this, this check here. And what, if this evaluates to, to 0, 1 based, after we add them together, that determines whether we move our offset up by 1. Right? So there's no if clauses in SIMD. So we, we can't run the, the if, ver you know, if and else version of this code. Right? We, we basically always have to run this one. So the way to vectorize it is pretty easy. Right? Because now, instead of getting a single tuple, now I'm getting a vector tuples. I load the key I want to evaluate on into some SIMD vector or SIMD register, not specifying what size. It doesn't matter. Then I can run bitwise operations to, to do the comparison. Sorry, I can run the comparison operations on the key that would then pr produce bit masks that I can then and together, and that's going to determine whether a tuple has been satisfied this predicate or not. And again, I'm not showing you the, then the code to make sure we remove things when we come back around the second iteration. We can ignore that for now, right? So, again, this is me walking through what I just said. Skip all this. So instead of using, again, placeholders like low and high, let's actually use real values and some, and some real data here, right? So, again, think of this as that there's eight tuples here, and then the key is some single character, right? It could be a dictionary code. It doesn't matter, right? So it's not a string going across. Each element, each tuple is a, is a, you know, has a single, string, uh, single character string value. So to do this in SIMD, is that you would first do that SIMD compare, right? And that's the first step here. Is something uh, is the value within a given key greater than or equal to a low value? And that's a single SIMD compare instruction that then can produce a bit mask. Then I got to run the second half of the comparison, produce another bit mask where the key is less than less than or greater to less than or equal to the high value, the letter U, and that produces another bit mask. So I have two now bit masks sitting in CPU registers. And I can then run a SIMD in operation and in instruction to just compare those two bit masks. It produces a new bit mask, and that tells me here's all the tuples that actually qualify or satisfy the predicate. And then I, if I want to get, return it back to which offsets in my input vector are actually were set to true, I can then pass in a sequence, 0 to 7. And for any, any, two, in any bit that's set to 1, uh, I just do a SIMD compress operation to then produce a, a single SIMD register that has these values here, All right? So there's other tricks you can do. Obviously, there's like 
if I can run a, a rank instruction to determine how many ones I actually have in any of these bit masks, if they're all set to zero, then I can bail out and not do the other steps. Yes? So this is all offset. That's not a bit mask, right? Or is it, is it just like an instruction? This? No, no, no. All offsets. Yeah, his question is, what, what, all, what is all? Mask, right? it's, it's just a register. Yeah. 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 Okay. And there might be even, I think, some instructions that, that, that can convert yeah. this automatically now. But I'm just visually showing it. Right? So again, like, how would you actually implement this in a real system? Well, again, if you take the vectorwise approach, which again we'll cover more in the next class, you would have an explicit function that says, uh, you know, string an input key, input column of eight elements or some number of elements uh, of a certain type, run the greater than or equal to comparison operator for a given constant. So you, you invoke that function with the, the pointer to the column and the, the constant value, and then it just loops through that and does com the comparison one by one. So then the, the compiler can then auto-vectorize that to do the SIMD instruction to put the data that you're trying to compare against into a SIMD register, run the SIMD compare, and take the, and take the output. Yes? Doesn't the selector store take a bit mask and simply store it into memory? Why do we have to do the compress uh, step? This question is, doesn't the selector store take a bit mask and store it into memory where you want it. Um, I'm just showing you how to, how to like, just yeah, just how to take this, convert this into a position list. You can. <coughs> Actually, he brought up a question earlier. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Like, how could I, how could I generate all the primitives for all possible variations of where clauses? And this is a good example where. Maybe order vectorization isn't going to be exactly, <coughs> sorry, exactly what we want because, again, if this thing, if the primitive that's going to do this evaluation, if it produces this matched offset, what I really want is is the bit mask, so that I can then take the take the two outputs and run this SIMD in myself. So <coughs> there are going to be variations of of the primitives where sometimes you want to just produce this match offset list immediately. And other times you actually want to get the bit mask out because then feed that into some other operation that take two bit masks and, and can run them together. So how to auto vectorize all of this is actually not, not trivial. And again, it has to take a few minutes to come and figure out how to compose these operations together based on what you know, the additional things you need to do in, in the query. Again, we'll cover more of that next class. So we can now uh, go back to that paper we said before from the Germans. Uh, plus me, um, and Peter Bonds, he's Dutch, but the, the, Dutch, the vectorwise guy. But now we can actually run his version of the of vectorwise, and he's going to use AVX five twelve for everything because this was it's easier to again to use the bitmap registers to do um, vertical vectorization. So I'm going to show results for both the um, for 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 three different operations within a scan. Uh, so the hashing to to hash something, put it into a hash table without putting it in the hash table. Uh, a gather operation and then, and then join probing it, um, and then we can see you know how much the the SIMD stuff helps for over a scalar instructions. So I again strip out the rest of the system to say for actually the core algorithm of doing the scan operations and other things in a query plan, how much does SIMD help? And so what you see is that across hashing, gather, and join, if you vectorize it, uh, you get a bigger win for hashing and a bigger win than join over the scalar value, right? So up to 2.3x improvement in performance. But that, again, that's just doing the, the bare minimum you need within that scan operation, right? Just, just doing the hashing or, or doing the, the join probe, all right? When you bring it to the rest of the system and now start worrying about getting data in and out of the registers, materializing results, going from one operator to the next, then you see the performance difference is not that significant anymore, right? So you put it in a, in a full query, uh, the difference between the scalar operations is, and, and the vectorized one is actually not that much. And this is the best case scenario of like, it's handwritten code. It's uh, everything's in memory. I forget whether it's what scale factor one. Yeah, so so it's going to fit in CPU cache. It's not that big, or most of it's going to fit in CPU cache. So, what gives, right? But again, so the, the the what's going on is that it's not just a matter of like okay, we can, you know, it's Amdahl's law. What portion of the query is actually going to be the part that could be vectorizing and get the biggest win? It's not all of it. It's not a sizable chunk. 
So you're only going to get maybe you know get a 10% 10, 10, 10 bump for, for vectorizing just like that one small piece of the code. So all the materialization overhead that, that's, that's going to slow us down. And that you can't vectorize. So this is somewhat deflating. Like, again, if, if I just said, you know, spending an entire lecture about how great vectorization is and how great, you know, and how much can help, but, you know, it doesn't actually make a big difference when you run a full query. That's true for a lot of things in, in databases. But these, these things are cumulative. You obviously don't want to, you can build the greatest query optimizer, but if your query engine sucks, it's going to run slow. But if you have an amazingly fast query engine, but you have a, a bad query plan, it's going to run slow. So it's, you know, all the lectures put together is what you need to put, you know, get things to run fast. You know, get that order of magnitude and performance difference. Okay. So one of the big problems that in the paper you guys read was that they, they spent, I think, two chapters on or two sections on was the problem of underutilization, where you have some lanes being uh, containing tuples that have been invalidated or, or should be discarded, but because we don't want to always move things in and out of the registers, you may have to continue processing dead tuples, so to speak, uh, and, and, but you're essentially wasting, wasting uh, resources, right? So the situation would, would sort of be like this. So if I say I have, a, I have a query, select count star from table where age is greater than 20. And so in my sort of pseudocode of this, again, I realize this is, this is a branching version, so it's a branch list, but for now it's fine, right? As I'm scanning along the table, I may have a bunch of tuples here that would get invalidated, uh, and I don't want to include them in my aggregation. So if it's, if it's, um, if it's scalar code, no big deal, right? Because I just loop back around and go get the next, next batch. But it's vectorized code. I may have you know, eight, four to eight, 12 tuples in my vector, and some of them might not satisfy this predicate, but now they're going to be strung along in, in my, um, in my, uh, sorry, in, in, my, in my, my, my vectors. So you sort of think of that. This piece right here is the, sort of the first pipeline, and then the second pipeline is, is this piece here. So we want to avoid having to pass along dead tuples in this, right? And so the, the idea that I'm about to show you is basically, instead of having the, the materialization you know, point be at the, at the um, you know, at a pipeline breaker, we actually could introduce artificial pipeline breakers or synthetic pipeline breakers that we, where we can materialize from results, go back in our loop, get more data, and keep filling up this, this, this mini buffer, if you will. And then once that's uh, filled up, we know all the tuples there aren't dead or they're all useful. Then we can proceed up to the rest of the, the computation in the, in the pipeline. So this is a paper, uh, I think it's citation 16 in the, in the paper you guys read. It's a paper that, I, that we worked on here with my PhD student, Prashant, um, who's now building, you know, working on the, the photon vectorized engine at, at Vectorwise. Um, so this is, the idea is that we're going to decompose pipelines into substages that can operate on vectors of tuples just, as, you know, just as with vectorized processing using SIMD when, when possible. But then the idea is that we can, we can start storing things in, in buffers, fill up a, a SIMD register, and then move on to the next stage. And this, again, so we don't have wasted, wasted computation, wasted, wasted resources. So the idea, uh, so it's called relaxed operator fusion because the idea is like you're taking the, fuse, the operator fusion approach from the hyper guys and actually relaxing a little bit and introducing these, these breakpoints. So the thing, first thing is that you, you figure out these are the vectorization candidates. Clearly, I want to filter, I want to vect, vectorize the filter operation. And that, but before I maybe do the aggregation step, I want to materialize some results, make sure that all gets filled up, and then I can do the, the aggregation computation uh, using SIMD and vectorize that without worrying about throwing, out way, throwing away unneeded results. Right? So the code basically looks like this. So I'm scanning through the, the, as a vector tuple. I do my comparison. If my buffer is, is full, then I can go, uh, go fill it. You know, if this thing gets full, then I can go to the next stage within my pipeline and do the aggregation. Otherwise, I loop back around and you know, get the next batch. So this buffer is sort of incrementally getting, getting full of values so that I can then fire this off uh, again in, in a vectorized manner. So yeah, this, this is the first part here. And then this is the second part here, right? And then obviously the emit at the end. So one of the tricks that we figured out with this, though, is that because you have this like staging point in this really tight loop, you actually can start doing software prefetching. 
Um, so there's hardware prefetching where the CPU is going to try to figure out which, what pieces of memory you're going to need next and starts bringing that into your CPU cache. Like if you're scanning along some long stride of memory, it starts bringing in cache lines ahead of, it, ahead of what you actually need. But in, in x86, you actually can pass hints to the CPU and say, hey, I'm going to need this memory region pretty soon. Um, it's not required to actually obey your, your, your request. Like, it's like a hint. Uh, but in some cases, it actually can make a big, big difference. right? And this staging stuff, because it's, it's sent, you know, having this, instead of this really long pipeline, so you're breaking up these substages, it's sort of a nice natural boundary for prefetching operations. So again, this is sort of jumping ahead to do query compilation stuff that we, we talked about before. But this is showing you that if you do holistic query compilation the same way that, um, that uh, Hyper does, which we'll read about next class, but then you also introduce these, these, these relaxed operator fusion stages, uh, you, know, you can get a pretty, pretty good performance. In this case here, software prefetching doesn't help because there's no join. There, there wasn't really a good place to say, OK, let me go and prefetch. But it, and over here, this does make a big difference because this query, query 19 can be broken up into these, these substages. Also, I think Q1 has a high selectivity, right? So like, yeah. it will not help a lot. Yeah, his point is correct. Q1 has a high selectivity, so like, you're not discarding. It's, it's basically taking everything. Okay, so let me, let me just let me skip this because I want to get to the hashings. But basically, this is the old Peloton system. So the interpreted our interpreted engine was total crap. It was like it was garbage. Uh, we converted it to, to compilation, so you got this this amount of improvement, and then between racked operator fusion with SIMD plus racked operator fusion with SIMD plus prefetching, right? You get a pretty significant win. So again, this will be next week. But going from a, this is not really like how to say this. I don't get the impression that like oh if you switch to compilation you're gonna get 97 improvement. This is like crappy student code to like high end prashant code, right? Who's now Databricks. Like that that I'll get you 97 percent end of the end day of the week. Uh, the thing I really care about is is going down here again that you can still get a pretty significant bump by introducing these these stages and vectorizing as much as possible. The newer version of Hyper and Umbra before this paper come out can actually use SIMD and vectorization, uh, but at the time in 2017 or 2016 they, they didn't support that. Because they were doing entire, you know, doing nothing but enti uh, the push based execution with complete compilation of the queries. All right, so this is one way to go start making sure that we, we're, we're always utilizing all our buffers. But again, we did this before ABX 512. Um, and in the paper you guys read, they call, this they call this the materialization approach. They also generate or discuss two different algorithms you could use that try to be clever about deciding when to go back and get more tuples from, from the, the operator below you. I think somebody asked a question about this, and I said most systems don't do this, but this is one way to do it. Um, and the challenge, of course, is going to be the bookkeeping to keep track of like where, you know, where did I leave off in the operator below me, and where can I write results into. And they can do this in AVX 512 because there's a lot more registers now. So the idea is that while my operator is running, if I realize that, that I have un unutilized lanes, I can just leave that leave all that data in that register, go then execute another part of, of, of the query, and have that write to other registers. And then once that thing gets full, then I, I can combine the two of them together. At a high level, that, that's what they're doing for these real algorithms. The question is whether you, do, you go get more tuples within your own operator by iterating over the loop again, or do you jump out of that operator, go below you in the query plan, and let the operator below you now start producing tuples up the query plan. So the buffered one is the one where you stay in, in the same operator. And the idea is that you use additional registers to sort of stage results, and so that the next iteration doesn't overwrite them, it just writes into another register. And then once that gets full, you can then use SIMD instructions to compile them. The partial one is where they basically spill out all the results within the current operator to a bunch of registers, go down below to another operator, have it produce more results up through the query plan, pushing it up. And then, you, uh, and then once, you, once, once that's full, then you can combine the two of them together. So you think of the 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 top one is more simple because it's like okay let me just call it you know let me call it next on my loop uh, you know within my same operator but I just make sure that I don't write the same register that I wrote before and I don't need to keep track of like where I'm actually writing to other other than like I don't write where I write before and this one you're trying to be clever and like okay I know that there's things up above that I could write into but I can't right now because these these lanes are being occupied so you're trying to like sometimes like fill things in at a more fine grained level. So again, other than other than Umbra, I don't think anybody actually 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 does this. I think everyone just naively uh, carries along the unused buffers on on, on or the um, 
carries along the the the, the dead tuples and then just because it's just easier at the end. Okay, so so far we covered uh, selection scans and vector refills. I want to quickly go through two variations of hash tables and then finish up with partitioning histograms. So in hash tables, the the challenge here is that we have this this data structure, this hash table, that kind of is not really SIMD friendly, right? Because it's this long stride of memory, but then we need to be able to do comparisons within uh, in contiguous regions of memory, and not within you know different lanes at the same time and contain different elements, right? So. The scalar approach would be you have some input key, you hash it with some hash function, produces a hash offset, you jump to that offset, and then now you just do, again, a linear scan uh, looking at all the, uh, the keys within the hash table until you find your match, and then you're done. Right? So the way to, to, to use horizontal vectorization to, to make this run faster is that you, within each offset within the hash table, we're actually going to store four keys with four corresponding values. So now when I do a lookup on a single key, I hash it, I, I, you know, and modify by the number of uh, buckets or slots, and then now I land at some memory address, now I get four keys. And now if I want to compare and see whether I have a match, I just duplicate this key in, in, in a single register, make you know, four copies of it, and then do, do the same D comparison, and that's going to produce a bit mask that says whether I have a match or not. And then whether or not you, know, you, do, you do the rank, see whether these are all zeros or all one, then you just do the same thing going down until you loop around. Right? So that's kind of cute. That's kind of clever. Um, the problem with this one, though, is like, uh, that like it's, you know, how do you say this? Like, what if, what if there's not, you know, the keys, these keys, these slots may be empty. And so I may be going fetching some location, and there's like two out of the four, four keys there. So I can't guarantee that I'm always doing uh, all my lanes are fully utilized when I do the, compa the comparison. So the alternative is to do vertical vectorization. And the idea is now I want to compare four keys at the same time. My hash table is just like before, before I do the, the, the have multiple elements for each slot. Now it's just, again, a single, slot, single, single key per slot. So I take my, my four keys. There's SIMD operations or SIMD instructions or SIMD hash functions. You can use Murmur2. I think there's a SIMD version of that that VectorWise uses. And then now I'm going to produce some hash vector. Then I use my, uh, my SIMD gather to go grab these different memory regions, put it into now a SIMD vector, then do my SIMD compare to see whether I have any matches. Right? Of course, now the challenge is going to be some of these tuples are going to match, some of these tuples aren't going to match. So then now in the next iteration, I need to, for the ones that don't match, they need to all go down by one in my hash table to figure out whether there's a match. But again, I don't want to keep be doing the same computation over and over again for tuples that didn't match. So I want to go back and get two new keys to fill in the spots that, that did match before. And then now another, I've run another round, and I just need to keep track of like at which, which lane as I'm going along it, it, you know, what iteration are they at? Like, uh, what location in my hash, hash table do they, do they need to go look at? So maybe this thing is sort of waste of computation for the middle guys, but that, that might be okay. That might be enough, right? So then do the same thing. Go do, do sorry, do the, uh, the gather to go bring them into to, to SIMD registers and do the comparison until I, all, all my, I, I satisfy all my, my checks. So his question is, is vertical clearly better? Yeah. Most times, yes. That's, that's, that's it. What's the benefit of the horizontal one? It seems like you're just doing it. His question is, what is the benefit so of the horizontal like one? Like so what is the benefit of the horizontal one? Um, again, the paper basically trying to, trying to, for every single core operator in a, in a Davis system, they had a vertical and horizontal variant of them to show that you could do it. Yeah. Right? And then, uh, and then they do the measurements and determine, oh, yeah, the vertical one is always better. Um, there's something else, though, that, that's tricky about this that, that may not be obvious. Um, and that is the, there's not always going to be a guarantee that the, 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 the output tuples are always going to be in the same order 
every single time you, you run this algorithm, right? Um, because the, the, you're sort of reading the keys in a different order. Sorry, the, the output is going to be in a different order than the keys as, as they come into the, to, to the operator. And on a relational algebra, that's OK, right? There is no ordering. But if you're trying to debug this, then sometimes you run the same, same query on the same data, and you'll produce output in a, in a different order. And it may, it's hard to kind of debug things to try to, if there's problems you're trying to figure out. Um, so it, it's not really a, you know, a, I would not say that's enough to discourage people not to do this. It's just to say, like, it's one thing to be aware of that, like, the, I mean, hashing always sort of randomizes things, but this takes it to a, to a, to a higher degree. It makes things even more challenging to work through. Because, again, the way the SIMD stuff is trying to do multiple comparisons at the same time. All right, so I'm going to skip the, um, this, this is the result from the paper. I, I don't want to spend too much time on it. Um, but basically, all, everything goes once, once you run out of CPU cache for these different implementations. Uh, and this is running on the Xeon Phi, which is an older Intel accelerator. Think of like Intel's version of a GPU in the, in the 2010s. They don't exist anymore. Again, same over here on running on Xeons. Once you run out of cache, there, there is actually no difference. Um, but the, you know, if, you're, if your hash table size is actually small enough, and that's why you always put the, the small table on the, on the build side, then you, you might be OK. And CPU caches have gotten way, way bigger. I think again, there's, there's the one AMD chip with like, it's like 800 megs for L3. It's insane, right? It's, yeah, it's almost a gigabyte L3 cache on a single socket. That's insane. Um, so. All right, let me show one other cool thing I like. And this is it's a really simple way to see, like, OK, how can I parallelize things with SIMD to do another basic operation in, in my data system? So how do we build it? We want to build a histogram. And so we want, if the problem is going to be that if we just do the naive thing, say these are input keys, uh, and we use SIMD radex, which is, we'll cover in a few weeks, but basically like, think of poor man's hash function. Right? You just basically grab the first bit, and it tells you where something goes. And so we want to uh, get the radix on this. We have our hash keys. And then we're going to fill out some histogram. But the, the problem is going to be we're going to have two keys uh, mapped to the same location in our histogram. And they're going to collaborate, them, uh, they're collaborate each other when I try to you know, put things, you know, sum it together, right? Because I'm going to try to overwrite to, to the same position. So to, to get, a, get around this problem, I can just replicate my, my hash table where for every single lane in my CMD register, I'm just going to have another array. And so now I know at, the, at, at you know, lane 0, it's going to write to this column here. Lane 1 is going to write to this column here. So for each, each column, there's going to be one entry for the key in my, 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 hash, my, ha, my histogram. And then I should just use the SIMD add to put it together across the lanes and then produce the, the final counts. Right? Again, there's a bunch of different clever ways you can combine you know, SIMD operations and instructions together to produce results, uh, again, with keeping everything in SIMD registers. So I, this, one, this one I like. And th th this is clearly when. OK, so we've covered this a lot, a lot already. Let me just put it out now on the slide. So AVX 512 is not always going to be faster than AVX 2. And as I said, in the paper you guys read, there's this little footnote down here where they, they mentioned that in their experiments, they didn't see uh, any downclocking issues with either the Skylake Xeon CPU or the Knight's Landing Xeon Phi, and that it, it, it was always running at a you know, stable 4, four gigahertz uh, clock speed. Um, but there's a, lot of, uh, there's a lot of blog articles out there and a lot of Stack, stack Overflow posts about, hey, my, my, my program's running slow. Why? And I, and, and I trace it down to my CPU clock getting, you know, getting downcycled. Why is this the case? Right? And the issue has to do with, um, in the case of, of Intel, they identify whether some instructions are either light or heavy. And if you run too many heavy instructions, then they dial down the clock speed, and your thing actually runs slower. Think of like if the CPU recognizes that it's getting too hot because you're not the fan's not running or something, it'll downclock itself so it doesn't burn, you know, damage itself. It needs a bigger heatsink. Right? <laughs> he says it needs to be a bigger heatsink. I don't think it's even that. I think that it's like hardwired that it just always down down cycles it. I don't, I don't think it's like try to sense the, sense the temperature. Yes? So I did further research. Apparently on newer Intel, Intel CPUs, this isn't as bad, but it still exists. AMD, they do this totally differently. They have 
hardware of 256 bit registers, and they use two of them to make the 512 bit register instructions work. So it's always faster and never downclocks, but it's not as big of an advantage as this could be. Yeah, so his statement is um, new versions of Intel, they've gotten a little bit better at this, but they still, I know for the consumer ones, they always turn it off, right? Yes, by default, it's off. But, but no, it's actually fused off. I don't think you can even turn it back on. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah. Um, and that AMD doesn't really do true 512. They do two 256 registers and they put it together. Yep. And they say that's always faster? It's always faster. Like, it should be kind of the same as but, DX2 in a lot of cases, but for encoding, decoding, it's a little bit faster. But does it have, the, the bit masking is the, the key difference from, from, in terms of databases. Does it have, I don't know whether it has those capabilities. Know, I'm not an right? Yeah. Anyway, uh, and there's, I, I, I can post on Piazza. There's some blog articles from like the Clang people or the, the, the GCC people were like, you know, they will always try to use AVX2 instead of AVX512 to try to avoid these issues, right? Now, you may be careful and say, okay, I'm going to make sure if I'm using intrinsics that I make sure I only use AVX2 to avoid this downclocking issue. But you may link in some library that it then gets auto vectorized using AVX512, and then, then your, you know, your database is running slower because of some third party thing that you, didn't, you didn't, weren't expecting, right? So uh, I don't know when you know, this all get fixed. Who knows? Um, but like, the safe bet is probably going to always be AVX2. But I do know some of the commercial systems do run with AVX512. And maybe they're just trying to be more careful about when, if and when they use it. OK, so to finish up, so vectorization is going to be obviously super important. Doesn't always going to be the, the biggest win. Uh, and ideally, you know, we, we want to rely on the compiler to auto-vector as much as possible. But in some cases, we do have to come in and either using intrinsics, which is more common, or one of those libraries that, that can mask the actual details of, of what, you know, uh, what sending extension package we're using. Um, and again, all the things that we talked about so far about doing inter-query parallelism, this is all in conjunction to the SIMD stuff. So every core is going to have its own set of SIMD registers. Uh, and so they, we want to use data parallelism within each core as, as much as possible. And again, we'll, we'll, we'll cover query compilation uh, next class. But that's another tool we can use to, to control the movement of data within our query plan uh, so that we have precise control of where things, when things go in registers, when they come out of registers, and how things are moved in, through memory or CPU caches. OK? All right, again, so next class will be compilation. So it, it's going to be a German paper. It's very dense. It's a lot of LL and IR. Don't, don't sweat the details of that. The main thing I want, I want you to get away from it is, or out of it is the, this notion of what he calls sort of data-centric computation. It just really means the push model uh, in, in this query processing approach. And that, again, he, how he's going to have fine-grained control of what goes in the, the CPU registers as things move up the query plan. OK? And then we talk a little bit about the, the project status uh, in preparation of the, the, the status update later this month at the end of next class as well. OK? Any final questions? All right, guys. See you. Got a bounce to get the 40 ounce bottle. Get a grip, take a sip, and you'll be picking up models. Ain't no puzzle, I guzzle, cause I'm more man. I'm down in the 40, and my shorty's got four cans. Stacks and six packs on the table. And I'm able to see St. Eyes on the label. No shorts with the cloth, you know I got them. I take off the cap, but first I tap on the bottom. Throw my three in the freezer so I can chill it. Careful with the bottle, baby, oops, don't spill it. Cause St. Eyes is said, the paint I wet. You drink it down with the guys, it'll run head. Take back the pack of duds. You go get you some same knives and drink it to the suds. Billy D is the silly cheese, sit down with the weak guys. Be a man and get a can of St. Eyes.